It's funny, Cloudflare tends to do really well or really um, connect with digital native disruptive startups that are changing things. So DEP, the digital marketing agency, and cm.com, which is um, really disrupting the customer experience um, space. Um, and it's, it's an honor to have them here. Um, we also work quite well with um, disruptive parts of larger organizations where they're trying to break the rules to try and do something uh, and to build something uh, better. So I'm going to really try and level set with you about where Cloudflare is, where we see our position in terms of value to you. We're going to talk about where we're going in terms of digital transformation. And I'll try and give you an idea about our thinking around um, where our organization can help you in 2023. Um, but really, it's a story about two inventions. Um, Holland has a, a massive uh, history of agriculture. In fact, you're one of the world's largest uh, exporters of, of food, and that's great. And certainly right now, that's, that's a good commodity to have. Um, but I would say that agriculture, farming, is the greatest invention that mankind has ever invented because it brought us together. So I want to take your mind back 11,500 years ago when the, uh, the Ice Age finished. When the, ice is, when the ice receded and mankind emerged from, from, from caves, frankly, uh, we started to farm. And the reason we started to farm was largely because of this little guy, the Egyptian dung beetle. Now, what he does is he takes pieces of dung, he rolls it, he spreads it, and he buries it. And he did it for thousands and thousands of years. And around about 9,000 uh, years ago, civilization stopped going out and hunting and stayed at home and farmed. And this was incredibly significant because if we didn't stay at home, well, there wouldn't be as many of us, we wouldn't have developed art and crafts and literature and technology. I mean, uh, you, you know, the, 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 in Babylon and in Egypt and um, all around the Levant, it was a booming of civilization. We had uh, water irrigation around about 9,000 BC. We had glass around about 7,000 BC. Great innovation came largely because of this little fella for making the land fertile. So I'd just like to take my hat off to uh, the Egyptian dung beetle. And I also, I have to get, a, if I can't get a dung beetle into a presentation, it's not a good presentation. Um, but what did we do when we generated food? Well, what we did is we stored it and we traded it. And we, we stored, it, stored it and traded it and then we created villages. And instead of going out to hunt animals, we brought them in and we started to farm animals as well. We created great wealth. But unfortunately, when you create great wealth, what happens is someone wants to steal it. So, you know, the, 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 the artisans of that time, they created great wealth because they had their choice of tools and their tools were kept clean. That's basically it. Now, there's an analogy there because the digital artisans of right now need to have their choice of tools and they need to be kept clean, but I'll go into that in a minute. When we create great wealth, people want to steal it. Now, if you have natural defenses, such as Mont Saint Michel, you know, you need a boat to get to it. So it's actually pretty cool. But for most of us, you have to create walls. And this is, uh, as you know, this is the Tower of London. It's um, 10 minutes away from my house. And in there is the most valuable object in, in the UK. It's the crown jewels, right? And the crown jewels are protected inside a building here by all the walls and the brave folk that are going to protect them. Bob with a spear, right? If you want to get to the crown jewels, you have to go past these war heroes to get to them. And I promise you, you're not. It may look like an old fashioned thing, but it's sharp. And there are people there with machine guns as well. Um, so this castle and moat approach to s securing the greatest assets works if it's something valuable that can be stored inside a castle. You probably know where I'm going, right? What's really valuable right now is outside the castle walls. It's the people and the data and the way that they work. So this castle and moat approach that's been ingrained in us for the last 9,000 years unfortunately is what we first did when we first decided to get networking. We put a data center there, put a bunch of tin, make the network go through the tin, do all the security. So how do you think it's worked out? I mean, if you look at the raw numbers, well, how about I tell you? So on the left here, this is the CyberEdge 2022 uh, report. So CyberEdge asked 
1,200 CISOs from around the world. Two questions in here. One is, have you been compromised last year? And do you think you will be compromised next year? <laughs> this is not success, right? <laughs> In the UK, 8 out of 10 customers said they had been successfully breached. In Spain, it's 90%. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was living in a neighbourhood where between 8 out of 10 and 9 out of 10 of my neighbours were successfully broken into last year, I wouldn't be questioning whether they got the right lock. I'd be questioning the concept of locks altogether. It's abject failure. Not only in the industry, and I'm sorry for that because I'm part of the establishment, but in the way that we go about things. Because the chances are you've been breached. A bit more optimistic, we might not get breached. I mean, in Japan, it's going to get down to 87%. You know, it's, it's crazy. Our expectation is that we're going to be breached. And according to IBM, the cost of being breached is pretty expensive. Now, I know not all of these breaches will be as expensive as that, but we shouldn't. That's not good, you know? <laughs> and they say the art of intelligence is not doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different response. We need to approach things from a different perspective because we want to protect these wonderful people. Because if we're going to, we're all in our 20s and 30s here, of course. Um, <laughs> if we want our pensions to be worth something, these people have to be successful. Everything we do has to make sure that they don't notice the security, that they're not put behind a wall you know, with big guys in front with guns. We need to start thinking about things differently, and that's what Secure Access Service Edge is. So at Cloudflare, we're incredibly passionate about the internet. We believe the internet could be the number one invention, greater than agriculture. But the problem is, <laughs> when Vint Cerf and Leonard Kleinrock, when Vint Cerf invented, invented TCP IP and Kleinrock inspected, invented uh, packet switching, they did not invent it for what the needs are right now. The internet is not safe enough, it's not private enough, and it's not fast enough. That's what we're trying to fix. So, this is the old ARPA uh, network, by the way. It was designed uh, to get the Pentagon packet over to the, over the Stanford University packet as quickly as possible. Um, as we know, uh, the information superhighway super has, has happened, and there are innovative companies all the time that are using um, great new ideas, these, these digital native, we have many here, these wonderful digital native companies that have been transforming the world. And if you're a large company with a traditional business, it, it's the, you, you will not even know who's going to disrupt your business. And that's what we're doing. So at Cloudflare, we have a number of different acts, if you like. The first act that we had was CDN and you know, the core type L7 type stuff. And we smash past the competition, or past the on-premise competition. We're disrupting that market. You can have it as a service if you want it for free, even if you're an individual. If you just want to test it out, you can have it up to a certain number of licenses. But the point is, we disrupted the CDN market, we disrupted the DDoS market, we disrupted um, a whole bunch of other um, markets, and we're disrupting the SASE market as well. So, um, four years ago, uh, our company decided to ditch the VPN that we had and uh, go zero trust network access. So we looked at um, what, what Google had to offer with uh, Beyond Corp, and we thought we could do that better. So we developed a zero trust network access solution that's based on a web application firewall that's globally distributed. Um, two and a half years we just, ago, we developed a forward proxy uh, integrated with our DNS, so secure web gateway as a, as a service, and we're continuing to launch new uh, innovative technologies. So. Um, COVID, yeah. Uh, isn't it great that we're physically here today? Because <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't cope with any more Zooms, honestly. <laughs> it's just too much. Um, Satya Nadella said that after the, first two, after the first three months of COVID, he said in an earnings um, announcement that Microsoft had seen three years of digital transformation in three months. Because people had to do it. It was ne necessary. People had to stay at home because you're going to catch something if you don't. COVID was probably the biggest uh, accelerator of digital transformation in the, last, uh, in the last decade or so. And our memory of COVID is, it, the things we do in COVID it stays with us. So, um, well, it takes two months for behavior to become automatic. Have you, anybody had that conversation with your child at home in the middle of COVID when it's like, how do I message somebody? My work stuff doesn't work properly. We'll just use WhatsApp. 
<laughs> that's safe. <laughs> um, but people are behaving at work in different ways now, fundamentally. People aren't necessarily going to want to go back to the office in the same way they did before, because they've learned how nice it is to spend more time with a family. Buying, right? Shops, retail, you know, who, who goes physically to a shop and is surprised by what's there? Most of us buy it online and pick it up or, or return it. Um, so the behavior of our buyers and our customers are, are changing. And of course, you know, the, the, with NFTs and crypto and, and Web 3.0, you know, the, the emerging technologies are, are in, getting to market incredibly rapidly at the moment. And that's going to increase. Um, more than anything else. We've seen the stuff that we relied on, and I kind of was a bit unsure about this because Oracle have a really good cloud service, but um, we've seen the stuff that we've relied on in the past, the physical on-premise technology, the expensive, I mean, you know, who, who's ever had Oracle licensing in the past or EMC licensing? This is, this, these are systems that are designed by executives for people to use, get deployed in three years' time, and you're stuck with it for a decade, right? The whole concept, the whole buying um, process around on-premise stuff is different to as-a-service stuff. You know, why commission your, your Dell servers to do storage, network access uh, address storage, when you can just buy a bunch of Dropbox licenses? You know, the, 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 the consumer meth, um, mindset ha is applying itself to app, uh, application choice at the moment. So, um, Right now, we only have Cloudflare in there. It's probably not, probably not a complete list in there, as in we're the only one. Um, but 25% <laughs> of the world's internet goes through us, so we thought it would be okay to do that. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm being honest here. Um, so digital transformation is all around us. You're, everyone's on it in some way, shape, or form. How can we change? Well, changing by completely big bang is only really possible if you're a brand new startup, because you don't have the the legacy that, of the complexity that you normally have. Um, where we're seeing customers get, gain real success around digital transformation as a result of the cultural transformation is little steps, small walk, crawl, walk, and a run approach. Find things that are going to be meaningful to your business that would uh, be in line with the zero trust architecture or zero trust methodology. Find things that would you know, take the cost and power and complexity of on-premise technology and buy it as a service. That's what we're seeing people do. Little bits here and there. So um, how can you become more, more um, digitally native, so to speak? Well, you could buy more hardware and start sticking it around the moat and everywhere. You could put, go buy, um, I don't know, a firewall and stick it on someone's house so they're nice and protected at the house. And ask them to carry the firewall wherever they take their mobile phone. It just doesn't work, right? It's, it's, it's pointless. Buying more hardware, even getting the, even buying hardware now is hard enough, right? <laughs> Anybody tried to place an order with Cisco recently? Um, not knocking Cisco, they're a great company. One of the options that can't exist is buying more hardware. You can't put a firewall in every single, next to every single cloud application you've got or every single user. Just creates complexity. Remember, remember this? <laughs> it's like, what does that do? <laughs> I've been to a few data centers like that. Well, another option is you can buy lots of different cloud systems. Um, you buy a CASB, there's plenty of companies that make those. SWG, I used to work for Zscaler, and buy that one. Yeah, you could buy a DLP system from someone else, a DDoS system from somebody else. You could add, put the complexity into the cloud, buy lots of systems. You're still stacking stuff, it's just you don't have the physicality of it. It's good that you don't have the physicality stuff because you have a service level, but what happens when something goes wrong? It's even worse. You, can't, you, know, you haven't got visibility into the cloud application you're buying quite often. So you could put the complexity into the cloud. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, but the, rec the option that I would recommend where we're going, uh, where our mindset is, is take a collaborative mindset. This is, this is Tom Soderstrom. He's the CIO of NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratories, which is a cool job. Um, and he made the symbolic move of changing his IT department's name to Innovating Together. Um, and I know pretty much every IT department works with the business, but this was a significant move. It made people think, well, actually, we'll work together. If you're, you know, the people that launch the rockets, innovate together. The people that make the, you know, the stuff that you need, want, you know, whether it's lander, work together. Innovate together. Innovate with partners like Cloudflare. That's what we're here for. Um, talking about partners, and we regard our customers as partners, um, 
what we have to offer is um, a global cloud network. So we started off as a CDN, so we basically put ourselves as close to humanity uh, around the world as we possibly could, right? We're trying to get uh, compute power, whatever that happens to be, uh, close to every single person on the world. Um, we're, and we actually put a node um, in the middle of the Atlantic, uh, sorry, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean um, it, it, on, a, on a, a junction point where there's no people living there. It's just because that was a really good thing to do. Um, so every service we run, and there's 30 of them, uh, runs in every Cloudflare data center on every server everywhere around the world. It has to be lightning fast. Remember I mentioned the internet needs to be quicker? Um, but what about the things that we do, right? So many of you will be using our CDN, um, probably load balancing, rate limiting, bot, anti-botnet type stuff. And these are our core application services that were what we had when we started off. What we've done is we put a serverless compute environment in every single node around the world so that you can develop your own applications. And people like Shopify do um, when they're trying to compete with Amazon. So developing your environment, your, your, your stuff as close to your users as possible is a good idea. Um, as I mentioned, we developed some zero trust services that are in use uh, with um, many thousands of customers around the world at the moment, and network services as well. So network and zero trust combined is our SASE portfolio. Um, I mentioned SASE. So um, we're trying, a big part of Cloudflare is our ability to help the, make the internet better for everyone. And many of our valued customers don't pay us anything. Uh, but what they do do is they give us advice about our product. They constantly feedback, um, you know, it doesn't work with that system there, okay, we'll go and fix it. You know, it doesn't work in this scenario, we'll go and fix it. And it's, it's a unique um, approach that I've never seen with any, you know, large uh, software or, or service provider before. So our on ramps the way to get into uh, our Zero Trust platform, uh, are very, the, the, the granularity of, of controls are incredibly deep. But once you're on there, what we're trying to do is give you services that are from one single stack that's located everywhere around the world. So you can take away the hardware and the, and the complexity. So this is one service. It's not, a, with the exception of email security, this is completely one service. It's been developed from the ground up and it's available everywhere. Email security is slightly different. We acquired a company called Area One in April this year. And we're, we're caref perfectly capable of making an email, secure email gateway. But what we really acquired was their intellectual property around the way that they scan email. So I mentioned that um, we, you know, the industry has really failed uh, our, our customers. You know, you've got a seven or eight out of 10 chance of being attacked. Well, according to, Accenture, uh, according to Deloitte, excuse me, the number one attack ve vector for identity theft, which is the currently uh, is, is the biggest challenge, you know, in, in t according to Verizon Data Breach, um, is email. You know, it's good old fashioned email. You know, I send you an email, you trust me, so therefore you click the link. You don't trust me, but it looks like somebody that you trust, you click the link, you download it, you, you do take an action. So what we do with Area One is we scan the entire internet Every week, we scan 8 billion internet things. So spoof websites, something that looks a bit fishy, a brand new um, uh, URL that instead of being adept is dep, you know, spelt wrong or something like that. Um, so, and we take that research and we apply artificial intelligence and machine learning to try and find the, the, anti, the phishing email. Quite successful, I might add. So we announced this week that that's been integrated with our service. And what we will be doing is um, further deeper integrations. So um, because of digital transformation, you'll have lots of things to do, right? People need to work from home. People need to work with more cloud applications. You know, you want to migrate your applications from your on-premise into the cloud. And what that would require is a whole bunch of technologies, right? Secure web gateway. Uh, everyone needs one of those if you're accessing the internet. DNS provider, you know, we have to use that for the internet. Uh, zero trust or VPN, if you want to replace your VPN with a zero trust. Cloud Access Security Broker. So what you could do is you could go a la carte. Or what you could do is have one service that does it all. And, and this is really important to us. We're going into, if we're not going into it, we, will be, we are in it right now, an economic downturn. What people don't need is more complexity and more cost. What we're aiming to be is the best value vendor on the market because we want to compress all of this into one easy to consume service 
that's easy to manage. The problem, of course, is identity as well. Um, as we are going into a downturn, sadly, companies are being acquired because there's lots of good ideas out there, but funding is, is drying up in some circumstances. So mergers and acquisitions is, is happening. We're seeing that accelerating. But, you know, I mean, I was chatting to CISO, one company on Monday, and he had 31 companies they'd acquired, ranging in size from a 2,500-person company to a two-person company. So multiple identities, right? So at you, with our service, you can aggregate identity providers, even LinkedIn identity, use that. Multiple identity providers from the same company. Uh, so to consolidate down um, one, one service um, into, a, into a way that makes sense. So um, as far as roadmap, I, want, I wanted to share with you the way that we see the world at the moment. Um, so these are just the security side of SASE, so what Gartner would define as SSE, Secure Service Edge. Um, so we have capabilities that we've been developing. So, on the, so highly differentiated, high growth. Okay, so the highest differentiated, highest growth product at the moment is remote browser isolation. Remote browser isolation can do three things. It can allow you to access websites that are uncategorized or could be malicious because you've got a virtual, in, basically a virtual environment. You never go to the internet. It could hide, so that's one use. It, it could be used in a zero trust environment where you're actually hiding cl cloud applications that you're using in your business that you don't want to expose to the internet because they might be old or they might have vulnerabilities um, or they might be third party. So you can hide your, your internal cloud applications behind a remote browser isolation, so it protects the applications. And the third area is it could be used very effectively where if somebody receives an email link, you just go through the RBI. So they never actually go to the malicious website. They just go to um, a virtual environment so that no data could, uh, could go and you have some control. So remote browser isolation, is, is, it's doing very well and it, the accel it's accelerating, but it's not a massive market. It's about 500 million in terms of globally. Secure email gateway and cloud email security. There's about four billion a year being spent on, on this, but it's a slow moving market. But um, we're very highly differentiated with what we're doing because all of our competition use signatures and that's just not hacking it, that's just not working in this new world. Uh, secure, uh, so zero trust network access. Um, that's uh, a very high growth environment. Um, everybody's got a zero trust product these days, right? But zero trust network access is, is doing very well for things like VPN replacement and third party contractor access. Uh, secure Web Gateway, you know, it's relatively slow, slow growth, um, but we're accelerating development around our Secure Web Gateway. So our, our cloud-based Secure Web Gateway, called Gateway, creatively, uh, combines DNS security, but also inline inspection um, of, of traffic. Uh, CASB, uh, an API-based CASB, that's quite high growth. Uh, we acquired a company called Vectrix that we've spent the last nine months uh, integrating their environment into our Cloudflare uh, dashboard um, so that we can get you know, guardrails around Office 365 or Slack or Zoom so that people can't set configurations that could be, could be risky. And then DLP, um, you know, for the last six months we've been uh, shipping a DLP uh, product privately to our customers. Um, we're accelerating development of that because we believe data is going to be more and more important. So, different components of SASE. So our focus is going to be taking those components and making them meaningful for our customers, right? Making it meaningful for secure access. So zero trust network access, remote browser isolation, and secure web gateway. Securing Microsoft with cloud email security, CASB and zero trust network access, and threat defense. So we're going to focus heavily on the customer outcome that's derived from these multiple products. Because what we don't have is a problem of integration. What we do have is the ability to start bringing meaningful value to customers. So to make those beautiful, wonderful people do better work, those digital native uh, teams, there's a few things that we need to do. So you can improve their productivity. You can give them devices or allow them to use their own devices if they chose to that would work for them. You know, their choice, you know, the digital natives, you know, the, their choice of device. Um, we can improve the security posture and consistently the user experience. Simplify the management of policies across all your environments. Consol remember, consolidation is, is, is gonna happen in this economic downturn. Um, reduce the risk and the attack surface. So we had a customer who came to us um, just as Ukraine, the Ukraine issue was happening, and they'd received a, um, a threatening note from, 
from the Russian government. And basically what they said was, if you don't give us a bunch of money, we're going to take you off the face of the earth, because they were opposing the, um, the, the, the Ukrainian issue, uh, you know, the politics. Um, so giving a load of money or being taken off the internet wasn't, wasn't a, you know, a great option. Neither of those options were great. Um, so they came to us and they said, look, first thing we need to do is we need to protect our websites, our public-facing websites. So we instantly overnight put a, a DDoS and a WAF. I'm sure you guys are very acquainted with that. It can be deployed very quickly. DDoS and WAF protection. Uh, but also they had a lot of cloud applications that they used themselves. Now, some of them, they could control access with Okta. Some of them were very old and they couldn't apply two-factor authentication to them. They were just using VPNs. They wanted to get rid of that. So what they did was they put our... Uh, zero trust network access in front of the old cloud applications and the ones that couldn't be accessed via Okta. So the application only talks to us, and then we talk to their identity provider, which is Okta, and then we do zero trust type checks, you know, posture checking, locations, that sort of thing. So we could, over the weekend, shield about 40 applications that they had that were particularly at risk. That was pretty cool. Um, enable multiple cloud applications and direct internet access, so avoiding the, uh, you know, the, the path through a uh, secure gateway, if anybody still uses secure gateways. Um, and there's acceleration stuff. So, so these fo focus on these use cases. So M&A, diversity activity, you know, bringing together um, multiple applications under a single platform of security policy, uh, wherever you've got apps migrating to the cloud. A lot of people, when they had a secure email gateway, you know, Fortinet or Proofpoint or something in front of their Microsoft email, they then moved to Microsoft email in Office 365 or, or Google email, and they didn't have much protection. Um, so it's, the topology of an email, on-premise email gateway isn't such that it can you know, lead to a good performance if, you, if you're going to cloud email. So you could put a virtual version of that in, in, in front of your uh, cloud email, or you could look at us. Um, Contract, contractor device, uh, who have access to your systems, you know, where you don't want to give them access to the whole network, or maybe they're working on um, some DevOps type stuff and you need to shield that DevOps um, environment. So um, that, that's a very good use case. Um, around threat defense, you know, there's, there's an awful lot of um, rethinking about what offices are at the moment. You know, should they be drop in centers or should they be formal offices with formal networks? And, um, you know, we want to give flexibility to people ar around that. Uh, so, you know, avoiding SD-WAN, we're going to try and leap f f into um, direct internet connectivity. Uh, threat defense around uh, phishing or ransomware. We, we, we have a lot of customers that come to us because they've been under attack. Um, you know, they've received a ransom note from the Russian FSB or they've, they've noticed there's been an outbreak and there's been um, controls missing from their defenses. Um, and we like to look at um, well, the, this sort of environment around the MITRE attack framework, you know, so where do we fit in in the attack um, uh, profile? And, and it's typically, with phishing, it, t it tends to be, um, with our email security system, it tends to be around the early stages. So, um, you know, w w we'd spot a lookalike domain, for example, in the um, reconnaissance phase, or uh, when they're developing their threats, because we're not using signatures, we can actually um, detect threat, threats as they come in a lot more efficiently. In terms of the MITRE framework, our um, zero trust network access solution is very good for the lateral movement, to protect the lateral movement around the network, because we're not giving access to a network, we're giving access to an application at the time it's needed. Uh, and then of course, the QWeb gateway is good for monitoring command and control um, noises, signals as they come out of the organization. Um, so, um, Threat defense is very important to us, and we'll be continuing to invest in that area. And then, of course, securing Microsoft. You know, as people migrate apps to Azure, you need to be performing quickly, they need to be safe, and they need to be uh, you know, s secure. And a, a bonus from this like the, uh, is, is, is around reducing hardware. So we're not um, targeting how hardware reduction at the moment, but if we can avoid uh, the, the need for network hardware, you know, that's, that, that's a, a nice addition. Um, I mean, really, we are bringing the IT, uh, bringing a network to you, really, with our, our magic, uh, magic WAN uh, and magic firewall. Um, so what we're trying to do is help you get rid of hardware and ha trying to help you get rid of point, uh, expensive point solutions and drive uh, efficiency 
by uh, standardizing the environment that you, you, know, you have and do that at an attractive price. Um, as I say, our, our um, way of thinking is very close to that of a, a, a digital native startup. So we can help you um, scale your, um, your business to the, you know, where, from wherever you are on the digital transformation uh, journey. And I think everybody, everybody is somewhere on that journey. We can help you scale. Um, now, um, I just wanted to sort of leave you with uh, w one more thought, really, because there's a lot of um, hype in the market around Zero Trust and SASE because, um, well, there's you know, a lot of noise from analysts and you know, an awful a lot of um, expectations from customers that it can do things. Um, and quite often the hype and the, the expectations don't always align. Um, but within the hype and the hope, if you like, in the middle, the stuff that works. So what we're trying to do is try and make that clear, is wherever you are on, on your digital transformation journey, whether it is old legacy VPNs that you want to phase out, or maybe it's you know, remote workers that need to you know, just um, get directly to applications rather than having to remember two-factor authentication codes and stuff like that, whether it's consolidating um, you know, the, cloud, the security that you provisioned across multiple clouds, wherever you happen to be, there's, there's, there's proven use cases that work. And zerotrustroadmap.org is our assessment of all the areas where the principles of zero trust could be applied to your digital transformation journey. Now, we're not just including Cloudflare in that, you'll be glad to know, because we, we're not the only player. And, we're not the, and there's some areas that we don't play in. We don't, we're not an IDP, for example. But IDP could be effectively used to reduce, um, uh, reduce exposure. We were attacked recently. Um, well, we get attacked all the time, but we were attacked um, in a, in a, it was publicly well known that our um, employees received um, SMSs saying, you know, hi, it's me, I'm Matthew uh, Prince, the CEO, you know, please click on this link, it's really important. And, uh, you know, in, we're a security company, you know, we, we make security products, but still two people clicked on the link and, you know, people are human, right? You know, people are curious, people do do stuff like that. It's, it's no bad on them. Um, but the attack didn't go anywhere. And the reason it didn't go anywhere is because we bound um, zero trust with our YubiKey environment. I don't know if you can see them, but they're tiny little things down here, physical um, tokens that we always have in there. And it, so we don't just rely on two-factor authentication. We also uh, can bind the identity to, to uh, a two-factor authentica authentication token. <laughs> Sorry, um, but we're conscious that the tokens are quite expensive sometimes. So uh, we announced today um, our partnership with YubiKey, uh, where we we're going to supply those tokens via the, the UI at a very very low cost. Sometimes as low as ten dollars per key uh, for our customers who want to use them as our zero trust. Um, so that's where we're going. We're going to focus heavily on those outcomes, those three outcomes. So threat protection securing access and securing Microsoft. Um, that's where we're going to be developing in the next, well, next couple of years. Thank you very much. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Ah, question at the back. Uh, one question is, I read online, but also listening to your presentation, that you propose to substitute uh, traditional VPN with zero trust. Yeah. Can you please elaborate on that? Because at the first time that I, that I heard about this approach, it was through your company. Sure. And I'm really curious about, uh, about indeed the approach. If you think about the history of VPNs, right, they were developed in 1997, in the same year that um, Blu-ray players were developed. You know, and I, I, I use Netflix. I've, I've, I've long since got rid of my Blu-ray Blu player. They're old technology, and they weren't designed for security. They were designed for connectivity. It's designed to connect this laptop to that network. Um, so when COVID hit, we saw, according to the, the, um, according to the Verizon Data Beach Investigations Report 2022, there's been a massive spike in identity theft. And the reason is identity theft is because of ransomware. Because people are using our, leveraging our tendency to click on stuff so that they can steal our credentials and establish a VPN connection and get into the network. And that's exactly what happened with the Cisco breach uh, two months ago. 
They gathered the VPN connections of a Cisco employee, it was bound to a public identity, and they were right inside the network and they stole 3.4 terabytes of data. N VPNs are not good security, they're good connectivity, but I would argue I don't even like them very much. I mean, do you, you, if you're running them, do you want to do you like VPN con concentrators? If you're a user, do you like remembering the, two, the, the second code? You know, if you're an administrator, do you like sending out the RSA tokens? No one likes any of that. So what we do is we have a, a global uh, reverse proxy, which is our access ZTNA proxy. So if you, on a clientless, um, if, so there's two, there's two scenarios where it could work. One is uh, with a warp client on, on a, on a, on a a company device, and that would then secure access to any, any application whatsoever via the principles of zero trust. So if you have a, an old on, you know, a data center, you have a, an old, I don't know, IBM mainframe application or a, um, a VMware environment that you want to get access to, you get access only to that application at the time you need it. So whenever that, um, people want to connect to it, they just get access to that. So we'll do things like we can check the devices is a company, device. We could check the device posture, you know, is CrowdStrike or um, Carbon Black or something. We can check which country it's in. In fact, we have an open API, so you can check anything that we is fed to it. So is it raining outside? <laughs> if it's raining outside, don't give them access. Uh, or more importantly, if you're having an outbreak, if, if there's a virus outbreak in, in your environment, you might want to tighten in, in your security. Uh, it can be used in a client-less environment as well for web applications, where the IDP would drive uh, the, you know, the user to, towards, towards that. So it's incredibly easy to get away from VPNs now. It's a lot cheaper, it's a lot better security. Does that answer the question? We can take it offline. <laughs> <laughs> That's no, but thank you, being very polite. <laughs> Does anybody else have a question? Well, thank you so much. Um, next, uh, we're going to have a quick break, and then next up, uh, Thomas Wesley and Sierra are going to uh, have a, a discussion. Uh, there's going to be some sweet prizes, actually, for in people interacting. So thank you very much indeed. Cheers. Thank you.